Okay, we'll start. Hello, and welcome to the Kymore Book Club. Good to see you all on this call. A uh, very warm welcome to you from Kymore. And uh, this is our fourth session of our fourth series of the Kymore Book Club. Uh, three weeks ago, we started a new series entitled Anticipatory Innovation, Capitalizing on Change in Turbulent Times. And I hope you've enjoyed it as much as uh, we have here at Kyle Moore and uh, just discussing with the variety of speakers that we've had and the great participation we've had with um, our registered participants. We have to date 12, over 1,200 registered participants representing 25 um, countries from around the world, which is just, it's really wonderful. Um, I have to thank, as always, our sponsors of the, of the book club that have made this a reality. And I'd like to thank Notre Dame International, who actually runs the Global Center um, that I work for, the Keogh Nocton Institute for Irish Studies, which was the founding institute that started Irish studies um, at the university and um, opened both the uh, Dublin Global Gateway and the Kymer Center. Um, and we've had a couple of faculty from that institute teach for us. The College of Arts and Letters, the Keogh School of Global Affairs, the Notre Dame Learning, uh, the Mendoza School of Business, and of course, the Notre Dame Alumni Association, um, who've managed to pivot in times of, um, of the global pandemic and offer all of these wonderful um, available courses that we have on the Think ND platform without Mary and her team, it's, um, you know, we wouldn't have such a plethora. So I wanna thank Mary uh, as always for her work. Uh, we have decided to use the, the breakout session um, tool by doing it at the end. So please stick, stick on after we've finished um, answering some of the questions that you feed through me through feed to me during the, the, the session this afternoon. I encourage you to use the chat function uh, and Zoe's sharing that in the um, link now, just just so you know, just or it's the chat, it's the chat button that you see, and then we'll facilitate the the, the questions to our guest speaker. So it's a great pleasure tonight today to uh, welcome back to the Kramer Book Club Sam Miller, um, who uh, joined us on the first session. Sam is the Director of Undergraduate Studies for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and an Associate Teaching Professor at the University of Notre Dame's Mendoza College of Business. Um, he teaches coursework in entrepreneurship and strategic foresight at the undergraduate and graduate levels and, um, and is a leader in developing and uh, del delivering courses uh, work and foresight as a lens of emerging opportunities and disruptive innovation, which is what is here to talk about today. Um, he spoke to us in week one about setting the stage for future-oriented leadership and full-spectrum thinking. This week, he'll be discussing how to unleash your creative genius. Hi, Sam. Thanks for joining us today. I thought it was a really interesting uh, read from Gelb this week. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for, for this fourth session. Okay, thank you for uh, inviting me in. And let me... Um share my screen and uh, and again, just uh, uh, express my thanks for the opportunity uh, to, uh, to join in. The, um, uh, the topic that we have for today is, um, is around uh, creativity. And what I, uh, uh, what I like to say is um, a creative genius. And the, um, it builds on the work that we started with in the um, uh, in the earlier webinars and um, and content pre-reads, et cetera. And really, what uh, what we're building on is in in this one from the from the um, you know the the videos to get ready for this is first this concept of entrepreneurial identity and uh, and the the role that the way you think about yourself and your role in the innovation ecosystem can be super powerful in terms of uh, the outcomes uh, and, and, the, uh, and the processes that you make part of your every day. And, uh, and it begins, we set it up in the, in the video, but I love the quote, right? That, you know, Steve Jobs, who I think might be remembered for a long, long time as one of the most entrepreneurial and, and creative and uh, um, innovative people that um, uh, that we've ever known had this quote after he got fired essentially from the company he founded, 
right? And he said, you know, when everyone wanted to hire him, hey, come on in and join our team. He said, you know, I want to, um, you know, march in formation. I want to, I want to grab a boat and, and head for the horizon and and uh, and see what's out there. And I think that's a really important attribute to keep in mind. And, and we set that up with some resources and uh, and commentary in the first uh, video. And then we went into the uh, the pre-read of, of the, the first chapter from this book that I love, uh, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, I think, you know, probably the creative master of, of human history, uh, or certainly one of them, and looked at these seven principles uh, that he embodied in the way he approached the world. And so with that as a setup, I'd like to uh, to put in motion a model that I use, and it's um, it's still kind of under development. Uh, I think that it um, uh, it someday might uh, become the, the premise, uh, perhaps, of a book. Uh, but right now, I use it as the sort of the cornerstone of a class I teach uh, in our uh, entrepreneurship minor. It's called the Idea Discovery Lab, and it's a um, uh, it's exactly what you might imagine, right? Fuzzy front end. Uh, of innovation and the principles that I that I bring uh, to life in that class are um, are those that I think where they intersect can really drive this idea of the, the you know this this idea spark uh, that at the intersection of these three elements curiosity and imagination and restlessness is um, where people who who aspire to be creative where they bring these three together something magic happens and uh and so what i want to do is to just quickly develop these out uh and then we can put it to discussion uh and uh because each of us every human has these attributes but they're not uh developed fully they're not um um acted on fully and sometimes it uh it dampens our creative spark. So let's look at these three. And uh, I apologize, I've got a couple of notes. Like I said, some of this stuff is still in motion. So uh, I, I want to make sure I uh, bring you the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, my, my latest and greatest thoughts on the topic. And uh, so curiosity. Uh, and I begin with what I like to describe as appreciative awareness. Right, and there's two sides to this, right? That that number one, um, you know, awareness, uh, um, paying attention with with uh, all of your senses and and all of yourself to the things that are going on around you, uh, with intentionality and 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 taking the time to smell the roses, to appreciate what you see, right? Tuning in to the emotional and even spiritual subtleties of nature's beauty and nature's aroma and nature's textures, right? Uh, understanding the deeper meaning of a musical score, how it, how it draws emotion out of you and, uh, and takes you to a place that, uh, that evokes a, uh, a certain uh, context. And, and it, an appreciation for fine food and, you know, whether it's coffee or chocolate or, or, uh, or any of those sorts of things and really paying attention to this can be a huge amplifier of creative thought, right? That Da Vinci described the five senses as the ministers of the soul. And, and, uh, but unfortunately our, the, you know, the path we're on in life sometimes uh, leads us to mute these things because they're inefficient, right? And they uh, and they slow us down. And they, uh, but we can challenge ourselves to really deeply pay attention to the, you know, to the uh, the colors of the sunset and the uh, and the and the uh, the patterns in you know in nature's rhythms and all of those sorts of things. And this is one of the contributors to this aspect I call curiosity, peripheral vision. It's a really, really powerful factor. Like I mentioned, the, you know, the the um, the jobs we have and the and the responsibilities we carry and, and those sorts of things lead us to focus on you know our uh, our main roles and our main accountabilities and uh, and optimizing for efficiency and 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 outcomes there and and 
it, that can lead to good productivity and, and good results and we get stuff done, but it also creates these blind spots on the periphery where, uh, where really interesting stuff is happening. And if we bring an inquisitive nature to that peripheral vision that we take the time to look beyond the, you know, the uh, uh, sticking to our knitting and explore the roads less taken uh, in, and ask different questions. It can really change our understanding of possibilities and, and, and fuel our ability to, uh, uh, to generate creative ideas, right? And, uh, and a lot of times it begins with, with asking questions, right? Uh, that we ask, uh, creative people ask questions that others tend to overlook. Even if they spot stuff on the periphery, they just take it uh, as, as second nature. And, uh, and creatives are, are less willing to readily accept the, you know, the, the, um, the obvious answers. And, um, and, and peripheral vision also, it expands our view, not just spatially, to look into other areas of interest but also temporally, right? That we think about uh, what we see in the context of the past and the present and even in the future. And I think this is a really powerful uh, uh, tool in the toolbox of people that are creative. Both of those two, the, the appreciative awareness and the inquisitive peripheral vision help us sense signals from the environment that can really inform us. But, um, but in the world in which we live, the the challenge isn't always just sensing, but sometimes it's sense making, right? And um, and this involves one's ability to generate understanding, deeper understanding of things that might be contradictory to uh, to expectations and uh, and full spectrum thinking requires that we uh, that we overcome the cognitive biases and the barriers that keep us from. Uh, from imagining uh, the, the possibilities of what we observe on the periphery uh, and with our, you know, with our deep appreciation. Uh, we, from, our, uh, from webinar number one, we, we uh, focused on a book by a, um, an author and futurist and researcher by the name of Bob Johansson. And uh, he talks about the, uh, the way that categorization makes our minds very effective and efficient in certain categories, but it can, uh, can really punish our ability to, uh, to see beyond. And, uh, and creative thinkers are able to deconstruct those, those barriers and boundaries, the categories, uh, and, and think beyond. And that's a pretty powerful uh, lens for imagining new possibilities. And so that's the third aspect of curiosity. And then finally, this thing we call ambiguity endurance. So I teach, I, um, amongst other things, I teach uh, strategic foresight here on campus and, and elsewhere. And, and people ask me, what is that? What is strategic foresight? And I, and I say, it's really uh, the art of asking and answering ambiguous questions. And, uh, and you know, ambig ambiguity sort of lives in the land of the unknown unknowns. And, uh, and sometimes, there, it's tangled up with complexity and, and contradiction and all sorts of things. And, uh, and so the challenge of defining a good question in that world of ambiguity can be exhausting, right? But creative thinkers embrace it. They love it. They, they challenge. They, uh, they push back on the original question being asked, right? And so their first question tends to be, are we asking the right question? about this topic. And, uh, and I think that that's really powerful that, and that um, in spite of the fact that ambiguity can, can just be overwhelming and exhausting, creative people get energy from this, right? They gravitate back towards those, uh, those fuzzy questions uh, at, the, at the front end. And, uh, and when things start to get sorted out, they have a tendency to hand it off to people to go and do the execution and optimization. And so, so this is this is the first uh, um, you know rung of the stool, if you will, that I, I call curiosity. And you know, I love this quote, right? That that millions of people saw the apple fall, but Newton 
you know, he, he, he kept asking and he kept exploring and he looked at the problem from different angles. And he, uh, and he asked, are we asking the right question? And, uh, and as a consequence of that curiosity, suddenly, you know, the, the, uh, he was in a place to really blossom with creativity and creative genius. So, so that's the first one. Let's move to the second one. Imagination. Like I said, we all have imagination and, and we're born with it. And, uh, but like I said, our, you know, our society and our education system and our, and our, uh, you know, our, our, our rules and expectations tend to squeeze imagination out of a lot of the stuff we do. But let's look at how we can build on this and what sorts of attributes uh, really can contribute to that creativity. The first is what I like to call kaleidoscopic thinking. And uh, I didn't invent this term. Others have, uh, have put it in context in this space, but I like it and I think it absolutely applies, right? That it, it's not just about imagining new ideas, but it's about combining ideas that are imagined. And that's what happens at the end of a kaleidoscope, right? That, that you, you view things from different angles and you turn the end of the kaleidoscope and different combinations emerge. And, uh, and uh, sometimes looking at a situation from a new vista gives you an entirely new understanding. And, uh, and, um, and combining things that, you know, maybe don't deserve to be combined, but the, uh, you know, the, the outcome of what, what Stephen Johnson, another author in his book, Where Great Ideas Come From, uh, talks about collisions of hunches, right? That sometimes in a, in a space of creativity, the idea that's floating in your mind is just a piece of the idea, not the whole idea. And it's, and it's looking to, uh, to, to, you know, for someone to turn the kaleidoscope and see the, uh, a new combination a new mix, and and that can be really powerful. Cognitive distance, I think, is a really important category, right? That so much of what we um, um, understand is based on the way our minds have been have, have evolved to work, right? That that our our, our minds and our decision making uh, have evolved to sometimes take the path of least resistance, which creates efficiencies, right? Which makes us uh, you know, a more successful species, right? If we're hungry, uh, we, we know how to find food, how to hunt food, we find water, uh, um, avoid danger, all of those sorts of things. But that keeps us in, in this proximity of what works and what's known. Creative thinkers are able to stretch uh, that cognitive proximity into new spaces. And, uh, and the thing to keep in mind is that that there's things around the way we see the world around us and understand, uh, you know, everything that we uh, that we see, that are based on these assumptions. That some of them are are below our level of awareness, right? They're subconsciously uh, in there, and it creates this phenomenon called capture. That even when we have a big idea, our mind and the minds of all of the people around us that we describe it to and, and we're working with, it pulls it back into the system that we know works, right? Because of the, uh, the way that our, our brains and our minds have evolved. And uh, creative geniuses have a keen ability to deeply challenge those assumptions and unlock uh, um, additional uh, um, possibilities by kicking down those cognitive barriers. And that's a big contributor. Storytelling is a big part of innovation to begin with, right? But but in this context of entrepreneurial foresight and that spark of a new idea that you know that that um, that could be described as you know in the neighborhood of genius, uh, requires that we uh, that we imagine the story from the future, right? And uh, you know the, there's there's storytelling techniques like the hero's journey or uh, or uh, design fiction is something that is used sometimes in the innovation space and. And, and these methods can yield deeper understanding, deeper meaning of what it's like uh, to understand a day in the life in that story of the protagonist. But, and, and it allows us to, to bring to life the possibilities uh, rather than, um, than sticking to one story, right? Future telling is a, is a, um, 
is a plural process, right? There's not one future, there's a range of futures. And, and when, we, when we have one official future, uh, it creates this phenomenon called capture that we, uh, uh, that we talked about in, in cognitive distance. But when we create multiple futures, uh, it unlocks possibilities. And, and there's a very important person that needs to be part of the storytelling, and that's the future user, right? The, the, this, this, this person who may not yet exist, who uh, is working on jobs and problems and, and, and challenges that might not yet exist, that might be addressed by enabling technologies that, that do not yet exist. And, uh, and really being able to have empathy with that future user is a powerful uh, way of imagining things that others uh, would, would not imagine. Uh, and then finally, uh, a, um, a category I call hitchhiking, right? That the, using the power, the, uh, the capability of um, associative thinking and uh, um, using metaphors and, and strategic analogies to do a lot of the heavy lifting allows us to go deep on the novelty and the, uh, and the new uh, possibilities that, uh, that might come from ideas that are being borrowed from other places. And this is pretty powerful. Uh, and there's, there's so many examples of where this has uh, been put in place, right? A guy by the name of Charlie Merrill, uh, you know, fought for years to come up with the concept for making financial planning and, uh, and investing available for, you know, the every person on Main Street. And, uh, and, and couldn't come up with a concept that, that others would support and buy into. And then he borrowed the idea of another new concept that was the supermarket. You know, uh, a wide variety and, and uh, prices that are published in easy access and, uh, and helpful uh, support and all of those sorts of things. And he, and he laid that metaphor down and then it allowed him to tell the story that became you know, what, what became is Merrill Lynch uh, and, you know, the, the, the Main Street investing house that changed the whole world for an awful lot of investors. Uh, Henry Ford had a young engineer on his team, a guy by the name of um, Bill Klan, and uh, he observed the, uh, the workflows in the meatpacking plants in Chicago. And he borrowed that idea and brought it into uh, the, you know, the, the, um, the automotive factories and created this concept that became known as the assembly line, but it was all borrowed on, you know, bring the, bring the products to the people and have the people specialize on a particular job and then move them on their way. That idea was already proven. And uh, Jim Dyson, one of my favorite creative geniuses, right? The vacuum guy. And he, he recognized the, uh, you know, the, the need to get rid of a vacuum bag, but he, he borrowed the idea from, uh, from the big cyclone towers in uh, in dust collectors and and, uh, uh, and and that sort of technology in the big in the big factories, and then he brought it into uh, to make it a part of the you know super successful vacuum that that bears his name. And so the idea here of imagining things that others don't, and I love this three horizons model, right? That we live here on this first horizon. This is the here and now. This is our current. Uh, set of problems and our products and our markets and our, you know, our, uh, our economy and all of those sorts of things. This is where stuff works and we optimize and we seek to innovate out on this second horizon. This is, you know, the, the, uh, the entrepreneurial opportunity that's, uh, that's awaiting if we can, uh, you know, invent and, and deliver. The problem is capture pulls those ideas back onto the first horizon and uh, and, and makes it almost impossible for breakthrough ideas to fight out of the boundaries of the, you know, the existing system. The third horizon, this is where real genius uh, happens, where we imagine these transformative possibilities and we, we knock down assumptions and, and barriers and tell stories uh, of people who do not yet exist. And then that informs our understanding of what the possibilities are. I love this quote from uh, a friend by the name of Jim Dater. He's a uh, futurist that uh, created one of the pioneering uh, foresight programs at the University of Hawaii. And he says, Every, any useful idea about the future should at first appear to be ridiculous because otherwise it's, 
uh, it's just a, an improvement and enhancement uh, of the status quo. And, and that's not good enough in this space. So that's the second leg of the stool. Uh, and let's look at the third one, which is this category I call restlessness. And what is that? Well, a couple of things, right? Optimistic paranoia, that sounds kind of scary, right? What, what's going on there? Well, the, um, you know, there's a, there's a great quote that I love. It came from uh, a former chairman or um, uh, general on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he said, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even less. And, and every, uh, every curve on the three horizons is, is destined to be rendered obsolete. And, uh, and creative geniuses, really terrific innovators, recognize that disruptive change is just around the corner and that uh, all of the rules of the game will be changed um, and that maybe that we'd be better off if we fought to change them ourselves, right? And uh, uh, but one of the things that's really interesting here is that they, they have a tendency to not view that as a threat, right? Because if we view it as a threat, then we defend what we have and we fight to preserve that first horizon. But if you view it with optimism, as it viewed as an opportunity, it changes everything. It fills the, uh, fills the, the, uh, the opportunity funnel with possibility and, and challenges you to chase it down. And, and, uh, and really creative geniuses have this, this fire in the belly burning uh, um, uh, sense that, man, oh man, we got to come up with something new because tomorrow might not be as good to us as today. Creative people are makers. Uh, they, they build stuff and they're always building stuff and they're always tinkering and taking stuff apart. And, uh, and you know, I love the quote that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but a prototype is worth a thousand pictures. And, and so we're always prototyping and testing and, and, and building. And, uh, and I think that's a really interesting attribute. And so what are the things that uh, that sort of fit into this category. Well, one of them is the concept of a messy workbench, right? And, and to a great extent, uh, you know, our companies and our, and our, and our bosses and our, and our families, they, they don't like it when our desk is a mess and our workbench is a mess. But the, a messy workbench is the home to a hundred unfinished ideas, ideas that are, uh, that are sitting there incubating, right? waiting to ripen and it takes time. And, uh, and so uh, building and testing and, and, and allowing things to, um, you know, to, to, to ripen uh, is a big, big aspect of, uh, of this maker instinct. And, uh, and something that I think is even um, um, equally telling is the idea of keeping a, an innovation notebook right? Makers keep notebooks and they populate. Ideas come into their mind and then, they, and then they're gone a moment later. And, and uh, creative geniuses jot these things down. They jot, jot them down visually. They, uh, they're always working on ideas. They're, they, uh, and because the ideas in the notebook become the seeds of the projects that make the workbench messy. And those two things, I think, absolutely factor in to creative genius. Ambidexterity. Uh, there's so there's a um, there's a book I love. It's called Loon Shots by a guy by the name of Safi Bakal, and he talks about in in innovative uh, uh, companies and organizations. There's basically, and I'm going to generalize here, two categories of innovators. Right, the, you've got the artists, and these are the people that come up with the big, crazy, you know, breakthrough ideas, and they're inventing and they're developing, and their ideas are, um, you know, they uh, they sound ridiculous. And then at the other end of the building, you've got what the author calls soldiers. And these are the people that take those crazy ideas and they, they work out the engineering and they, and they build them and they sell them and they, and they, uh, and they generate customer satisfaction. And, uh, and, and we've got these two sides of the, of the brain that need to be brought uh, into focus. And, uh, and creative geniuses can coexist in both of those worlds, right? They generally aren't super good soldiers, but they can get along with the soldiers and they speak their language and the, and the soldiers don't view them as a threat or, uh, or a distraction. And, uh, and so the idea of um, uh, um, 
having the ability to to learn the language and the priorities of both the artists and the soldiers can be really really powerful there's a quote uh from uh, thomas edison uh, that anything that won't sell i i don't want to build it right and what what he is suggesting there is that the artists in this world of ambidexterity uh, they they recognize that if the idea stays in the lab and and it uh, and it doesn't get out into the wild where it changes people's happiness and and uh, and and creates value and and um, and and quality of life for people that uh, that it's not worth spending time on right and and so that you don't just invent and design and and. Uh, and create just for creation's sake, but you do it because of the outcomes that can that can be created. And and creative geniuses recognize and are and, and get good at both of these. And then finally, the uh, um, this idea of urgency and uh, and um, the you know I, I think this is a big one. I talk to you know uh, entrepreneurs at all stages of life, and and one of the things you always hear uh, is that man, I wish I would have you know, done this earlier, had that idea and somebody else got it, or I, uh, you know, now I'm, uh, it's too late for me. I should have, I should have acted earlier. And, uh, and, and so the, the Greeks, Keros comes from, from the Greek, uh, um, uh, ancient Greek uh, language, and they had two words to describe time. They had chronos, right? And chronos is sort of like the chronological sequential nature of time, right? That Tomorrow will come and look a little bit like today, and uh, and next year will look a little bit like this year, and you know in sequence, and and you know next spring will have the you know the same attributes of this spring, and so there's not a lot of need for uh, for urgency and change, but then there's Kairos, right? And Kairos implies that the that time is made up of these moments that are fleeting; they are filled with opportunity that will fade away quickly and and never and never return and that chaotic sense uh, of um, suggesting that this moment is unique and it's filled with unique opportunity uh, it's a gift that will uh, that will be gone and creative geniuses bring that that uh, that chaotic sense of urgency they're always in motion and acting and you know I, I, I love this quote right the idea of uh, um, you know, from Dark Side of the Moon, which, whoops, might be uh, uh, showing my my age a little bit, right? But from the song Time, right? That that in the in the world of innovation and creativity and uh, and all of the stuff we're talking about, it's not a world filled with time clocks and deadlines and project management, right? That uh, you know, the, the the lyric says, "No one told you when to run." You missed the starting gun, and 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 oh, by the way, you didn't even notice that you missed the starting gun, and that's that urgency that comes into play. And so, those are my thoughts. I, um, uh, I like I said, I'm uh, I'm using my lab to uh, develop this. Uh, it gets a little bit thicker every uh, uh, every cycle, and the opportunity to share it with you is um, uh, is something that I'm very uh, uh, thankful for. So. Uh, you know, again, the, the idea that these three categories, uh, when they are amplified, can create something very special in terms of, you know, um, imagining and creating something that is, uh, that is entirely new. Um, and that each of these three categories, any one of us can get better at and, uh, and get in um, and, and, and and, and draw energy from, uh, not work harder on top of everything we do, but work on things that really bring us passion and, uh, and energy. And so that's, that's the, the, um, uh, my thoughts on, uh, unleashing your creative genius. I'm, uh, I'm happy to take questions for as long as we have, and I appreciate, uh, your time. Thanks, Sam really wonderful presentation. And I um, want to encourage you all to, if you have a question, just to put it in the chat and uh, we'll get to them. Zoe will feed them to me. Sam, to start off, I, I have a question about education and I, I'm pretty sure Steve Jobs dropped out of 
Portland. I think he was in Portland. I'm pretty sure Steve Jobs dropped out of college and, and went on to be so successful. But um, in my experience with a lot of successful Irish entrepreneurs, um, you know, education and the system of education has been met with a lot of skepticism. You know, these these entrepreneurs are self-made, self-taught and ingenues in their in their industry, similar to what you're talking about with the creativity. Um, but they didn't genuinely do well in school, you know, and found that, the, you know, the school system wasn't built for them. They were outside the pack. What is it about the pathway of, of, of entrepreneurs like, say, Jobs or Dyson, whom you mentioned, that makes them not conform to these sort of constraints of of Western philosophy of school? Yeah, boy, there's a lot of layers to that. I mean, you could add um, uh, Bill Gates and uh, and a long list of others uh, who even Michael Dell, who I think he did graduate, but he was breaking all of the rules and, you know, building computers in his dorm room. And uh, um, and uh, so the, there one answer has to do with the fact that the the sort of Socratic learning model that is the basis for hundreds of years of uh, development of an um, educational model is not really very well suited for this. And there's lots of people that have uh, that have uh, dug into this. You can find some really interesting TED Talks on uh, just how the education system, um, it, it, it's not that it doesn't reward creativity uh, and and restlessness. Think about what uh, what the note going home for your kindergartner to the parents regarding restlessness says, right? Like, hey, congratulations, you've got a restless child. No, uh, you know, you got to sit in place and you got to follow the instructions and and all of those sorts of things. And uh, and it um, and it permeates deeply into uh, the you know, the academic model, <laughs> excuse me, that is the university. And, um, and I find that the, the more heritage and legacy and excellence that the university has, the deeper that stuff runs. That being said, and, and, and Notre Dame certainly has a lot of heritage and legacy and excellence. But that being said, uh, there's a lot of progress being made. And a lot of that progress is happening here on campus at Notre Dame and, and all of the, the, you know, the various outreach that we do, uh, that we are recognizing um, that entrepreneurs are a different breed and, uh, and attracting them into our program, the types of students that we, uh, that we recruit, uh, what we do with them while we're here, and then how the, you know, the Notre Dame Alumni Network organizes around, you know, that opportunity is all evolving and it's moving very quickly. You look at the Idea Center, right, which was, a, I think, about a hundred million dollar investment in, in doing things totally differently and, uh, and taking um, crazy ideas and, and giving them the oxygen they need early on. You look at our entrepreneurship minor that I have the privilege of being able to, to be a part of, uh, up until about three or four years ago, it was in the business school. And so there was a hard and fast provision that in order to study in the minor in innovation and entrepreneurship, you had to be a student in the business school, you know, and it just, it, you know, it, it, um, we, we changed that, but it was difficult to change. And now we have all kinds of students. We have musicians and architects and, uh, and computer scientists and uh, and, and, and poets in the, in the minor. And it just, it, it makes it uh, an order of magnitude uh, more powerful for a learning experience. So, uh, and, and, it, and it goes across the board, right? Um, so we're looking at things like how can um, students earn academic credit for doing a startup on campus? Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and those sorts of things. Think about it. Pro probably a lot of people on this call were either applicants and, and, and students, or they have kids who have gone through the process. And think about the things that are most highly rewarded, right? Excellence on your placement tests and AP credits and, you know, and, uh, and the 
people that were scraping by with a B minus, but were starting their third business in the garage, they generally don't do as well on that. So we, we lose the opportunity to welcome them in. And so we're, we're asking different questions about who are we trying to attract and going out of our way to, to draw them in and even maybe provide some scholarship money and, and that sort of thing. So um, we're getting better. I think the, um, uh, there's a lot of change heading for the education system at all levels. Um, and uh, um, and it's, a, it's a powerful question, right? There's a guy by the name of Peter Thiel, who's a, you know, he's a, a billionaire, started a number of companies. He's currently the, uh, I think the CEO at a company called Palantir. He was a founder of PayPal and hangs out with Elon Musk and, and those guys. And he wrote a book uh, called Zero to One, which is one of my favorite innovation books. But he's offered a, uh, uh, a program, a $100,000 scholarship to anyone that, you know, that people apply and he awards a number of them, but you don't go to a college. He gives you $100,000 to start a business. And, uh, um, and that sort of thinking is, is gaining traction that doesn't fit very well with the traditional model of you know, earning a degree and then maybe earning a, you know, an advanced degree and, uh, and following a traditional path. So kind of a long answer to, a, I think, a really powerful question. Well, I do have, um, I have three little boys and I have one that's definitely a creative and he, was, he looks at problems different than the other two, right? So I think creatives, to your point about creativity, it, they do look at um, a challenge in a, in a totally different angle that the norm isn't looking at it. So it gives you, it gives you an opportunity to, to address problems or business opportunities from a, a completely different angle to your point about future, future, the future thinkers. Um, yeah, I'm, rem I'm reminded of, um, you know, one of the, the most creative people maybe to ever, you know, walk the surface of the earth was, was John Lennon. And when he was a, a kid in first grade or so, uh, the class was given an assignment. It said, um, write down what you want to be when you grow up. And he wrote down, happy and the teachers like you know sent him back said you you don't understand the question you're not doing it right and uh um and and that's just you know it's part of the expectations that are so deeply uh ingrained in our education model wonderful answer though um a question about i guess from from ireland looking into the us it just seems that the us is in a politically charged moment right now right and in in and, and, and also there's the context of the future potential like kind of a global recession and it seems now is the time where renaissance people are needed right from your reading that you gave us um that, that are needed to help deal with what could could be considered a dark period at, that you know in our moment of, of history that we're in at the moment and it seems that the technology which is an advancement um with, with the internet and what we have with the social media platforms ha has actually created a sort of ennui or a, a complacency so that we don't have that act of constantly creating or challenging ourselves but we're we're we're, we're plugged into other people's kind of ideas and and movements or thoughts and I'm just wondering if if you see this as a dark period and a renaissance about to come, or is there a, um, you know is there a way to 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 move ourselves out of this sort of um, technological kind of ennui that we're on when it comes to social media? Yeah, wow. I mean, an, another easy question that we can just come up with an answer for right here, huh? Um, I think there's a lot of layers. Uh, to that, uh, certainly, the um, the guardrails in social media are in question. There's there's all kinds of um, um, uh, challenges going on. I mean, it, it used to be that we got our news from a very short list of trusted people, right? I mean, Walter Cronkite, and then we went into a period where uh, where news could be created by anybody right uh and so you know things like the um you know the arab spring went went global with information that uh they couldn't be contained because people had you know a, a, a device and access to 
uh, YouTube or other places. And, um, and so we went from a, you know, a small number of sources to a large number of sources like CNN and others to a, an infinitely large number of people who maybe didn't know everything they needed to know to, to be on that pedestal. And maybe they had some sort of agenda uh, that, um, that wasn't in, in everybody's best interest. And we're going to have to figure that out. And that's, that's way above my pay grade, but, but there it is, right. It's in reality. But as a consequence of that, you know, the, I, I showed a quote before that every idea of value about the future begins by sounding ridiculous. And one of the consequences of this, you know, the, this, this, this social media ecosystem with so many sharp edges is that we're not sure what to do with ridiculous ideas. Uh, and, and I, I mean, I, I'm an innovator. I, I, um, I, I think that creative freedom is something that, that absolutely needs to endure, but we're seeing, you know, restrictions on, on ideas. Right. And, uh, and I don't want to get into the politics of it because some of the ideas that are being restricted need to be restricted. But some of the ideas that are just a little bit ridiculous, right, being mentioned by people that are restless, right, uh, um, with a you know with a curiosity, asking questions that that others don't. I I I think I, I'm a big believer that we're a smart species and we will, you know, um, the, 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 you know, the, the renaissance of, of the new model will, uh, will start to help us out. But I agree that um, uh, we're, we're going to have to work ourselves through some, uh, some, you know, uh, um, unknowns here. Um, and, and you hope that really good ideas don't get squeezed out in the in the context of you know uh, uniformity of ideas um and uh, because you know sometimes the the new ideas break the model right uh so yeah well, they, yeah they shatter the ceiling sometimes um i got a question from jack um thank you jack Project-based learning often ending with a wow showcase event of the product is being used successfully with middle school students in the after-school space. He suggests us to go to a website called citizenschools.org. Is that a type of learning that aligns with your principles of curiosity, imagination, and restlessness? Oh my goodness, I love it, right? Uh, you know, I'm talking about this in the context of a you know, a collegiate minor and a collegiate minor at a, you know, at a, at a top tier school. And, um, but yeah, we ought to be starting at the earliest of, uh, of ages and, uh, and turning these students into curious makers that, uh, um, that ask why again and again, and then, and then ending the semester with an explosion of celebration, right? Um, you know, the, uh, the space we're talking about is one where, you know, uh, failure needs to be embraced. Well, you know, K through 12 doesn't embrace failure very well, any better than, you know, than Notre Dame or any of our peers do. And uh, so when I hear of experiments or summer camps or, uh, or after school stuff like that, it just, it makes me smile. I think that, uh, you know, those, those are, uh, educators that are breaking all the rules and, uh, um, and, and, and reimagining things that, uh, uh, that probably get some of them in trouble. Right. Um, and, uh, um, but I, I think we need to be doing more of it. We need to be celebrating it more. Uh, and, um, uh, I, I love the idea. What, uh, what part of the, uh, of the world is that? Is that in the U S it, it sounds to me that it's um, .org, so it must be U.S. or Canada. Yeah. But oh, I uh, love it. I, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, turn, turn, turn it up to 11 uh, is, uh, is my answer. Um, question on your entrepreneurial foresight. Where does morality play in, in, in your teaching of entrepreneurial foresight? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, the, uh, we, we always try to, uh, recognize, uh, the force for good aspect, you know, I mean, again, we're, because we're, we're Notre Dame, but I think lots and lots of people, uh, organizations, uh, you know, uh, uh, recognize the need to, um, to innovate as a force for good, whether it's around, you know, equality and opportunity or environmental sustainability or, or whatever it is. Uh, I, I think in my model, it fits best with that uh, entrepreneurial identity, right? What is it that you internalize that you're, um, that you, you see not as what you do, but why you do it. And, uh, and I think that, you know, not, not how do you do entrepreneurial stuff like, you know, market research or, uh, or, or um, uh, product design, but what's it like to be entrepreneurial? And I think that that, uh, you know, mission-driven, purpose-driven sort of ethos uh, fits in there really well. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I don't apologize for, um, you know, believing in the, you know, the, the sort of building on the, um, uh, the Edison quote, right? That, uh, you know, that, that you got to get the stuff out of the lab and into the wild and, uh, and generate value with it. And, it, and companies need to, uh, to be able to, you know, to, um, uh, to keep some of that value so they can reinvest in the next wave. And uh, there's, a, there's a quote by a, um, an entrepreneur and a futurist out of Silicon Valley, a guy by the name of Peter Diamandis. Maybe you've heard of him. If you haven't, uh, go ahead and Google him. He's an amazing man. He's a co-founder of Singularity University. He he funded, uh, created the first Ansari X Prize, which was the uh, the um, the multi-million dollar prize to uh, to travel to space and back twice in I think a week. Uh, and um, uh, Bert Rattan and uh, Scaled Composites uh, won the prize. And now they're partnered up with Sir Richard Branson to, to create uh, Virgin Galactic. That's, that's Peter Diamandis. And he makes the argument that, uh, Hey, if you want to be a billionaire, find a problem being experienced by a billion people and solve it. Right. And think about what are the problems, right? Human rights, access to water, literacy, uh, healthcare, um, uh, access to energy, um, uh, you know, refugees, all of those sorts of things, that's the incubation lab that's going to start generating billionaires if we do it right. And, uh, and I think it absolutely aligns. I, uh, I, I'm trying to figure out exactly where entrepreneurial identity fits. I think it's an umbrella over the whole three, uh, three-legged stool. Um, but I would put that, um, you know, you could call it morality, you could call it purpose-driven, you could call it ethics, whatever, uh, force for good. Uh, I think it's embedded in that identity. Great question. I love it. Well, thank you, Sam. Um, thank you for, for contributing today and for the first session. And I want to remind everyone that um, if you're interested in, in, in visiting Kymer in the not so distant future, when we can all travel again, that Sam is teaching um, his strategic foresight program with us at Kymer. Uh, so he's lined up to teach for a couple of sessions for us. So keep that in the books. I want to also um, well, extend a welcome if anyone's interested in joining us. We are all we're, we we try to build community virtually because we know this is also isolating. In addition to the book club, we've also done some online cook-alongs with our chef David Harrison on Fridays afternoons. Uh, and this week, you're more than welcome to join this week as well at three o'clock Eastern time, five o'clock or eight o'clock Irish time. He's making chicken Parmesan due to high command demand. Um, the other, and I, we had another question from Rick and, and, and those who weren't able to join today. Um, these are recorded sessions that we'll have on, that will rest on the ThinkND platform. So you'll be able to go back to see Sam's lectures as well as um, his reading. 
uh, that he assigned. I think alone from this session, I I think we're going to have to issue a reading list, Sam. I've, I've, I've written down four books, at least, that we need to include with our uh, notes. So, so Rick, you'll be able to um, listen to this conversation on a podcast, and then you're also able to um, go to the summary notes that we'll have published once um, we're finished. Um, so I want to, uh, before we break out, just to, to, to break out sessions where you get the opportunity to talk to one another and, and get to know one another, I just want to thank you all for joining us and especially to Sam, um, to, to, to Dr. Melvin Dowdy who joined us and to Alma McCarthy who contributed to this entire ser series. And if you're interested in hearing about our next series, which will be in August, um, we will have um, To Hell or To Connacht, Sporting Stories of Inspiration from Galway. Um, it's a famous quote that William Cromwell um, said about, um, about uh, the, uh, the province of Connacht. Uh, and that's not to do just with the amount of rain that we get. So um, we'll be partnering up with Connacht Rugby and uh, searching out some, some um, inspirational stories and as well as um, you know the very controversial um, development of the of the, the national song for for rugby. So I hope you um, you join us for that in August. Um, but then in the meantime, you'll be kept busy with Think and D uh, with the Rome Book Club that's starting, and uh, another uh, another great series that we've uh, created with the Think and D platform. So once again, thank you all for joining us and for um, being a part of the Kymer Book Club community. I can't thank you enough for um, the support from Think Indy and from Zoe, who is the background communicator and tech technician and, <laughs> and now video editor as well. So thank you, Zoe, for your help with this series and all the series uh, that we have. So so we'll, we'll let you have a 10 minutes together to discuss and, and um, please enjoy the time that you have together. Take care. <laughs>